So people say, how do you get cancer? People say, oh, how do I get cancer? How do you get cancer? So we have carcinogens, radiation. We talked about that. You get exposed to a carcinogen, you're going to get cancer. These are what I call these risk factors. People, get, people can work in a, in a very toxic environment. You know, 50% of the people will come down with some sort of a cancer, but 50% don't. So it's a, it's a risk factor. It determined from your genome determines whether that risk factor will elicit a cancer. But the genes mostly protect us. Radiation, hypoxia, that means this absence of oxygen in a population of cells can damage the respiration, cause cancer. Inflammation, systemic chronic inflammation is a risk factor for cancer. Rare inherited mutations, like the BRCA1, you hear about Angelina Jolie and these people having their breasts and ovaries removed because they have the gene. Only 50% of the people that have that gene actually go on to get the cancer. It's a risk factor, it's not a determinant. The gene will cause the cancer only if it damages the mitochondria. If the gene does not damage the mitochondria, that person will not get cancer. RAS oncogene viruses, hepatitis C, papilloma viruses. These viruses cause cancer because the virus goes into the mitochondria, damages the respiration, and you get the cancer that way. So this is what's called the oncogenic paradox, and it plagued the field right up until today. People say, I don't know what the common pathophysiological mechanism is that we get cancer through a common mechanism. So we have a lot of risk factors that can produce cancer, but they all come through a common pathophysiological mechanism, which is damage to the respiration. Those ROS, R-O-S, are reactive oxygen species that are known to be carcinogenic and mutagenic. What does that mean? ROS cause mutations. ROS are carcinogenic. They damage the respiration further, and they lead to the gene mutations that people study in the nucleus. So the mutations that people are studying in the nucleus of the cell are secondary downstream effects of the damage to the respiration. They're not the cause, they're an effect. Now think about that. Think about that when you hear all these talks on the TV about this drug and that drug and all this kind of stuff, because they're all based on the gene theory. Aptivo, Petruda, all those things, these immunotherapies are based on the gene theory. Think about that. Now in his book, Emperor of All Maladies, Sid Mukherjee, whose book was on the New York Times bestseller list for about a year or more, Pulitzer Prize book, Emperor of All Maladies, he struggles with the oncogenic paradox. Doesn't mention Warburg at all. He struggles just like everybody else. All right? If they understand the biology of the disease, they will be they, they will understand what the problem is. So, the ROS then damaged the respiration. Now, the diagram on the bottom, you see the green line going down and the red line going up. Okay, the green line is the breathing capability of the cell. The red line is the fermentation capability of the cell. So cancer is nothing more than a transition away from respiration to fermentation, which can be caused by any number of provocative factors, either in the genome or in the environment. They're all risk factors. They're all what they call secondary causes. The primary cause of cancer is damage to the respiration within the cell, leading to genomic instability. And the oncogenes that people love to talk about are transcription factors that open the floodgates to bring in fermentable fuels into that cell. Because if you don't, respiration is a remarkably efficient way to get energy. Fermentation is a massively inefficient way to get energy. So if I'm going to drive the fermentation machine, I have to bring in large quantities of fermentable fuels that the cells can ferment. And those fuels are glucose and glutamine. The two fuels, the one, Warburg always knew about the glucose. He didn't know about the glutamine because the structures that were needed and the pathways were, def, were, were identified only after his death. So he didn't know the missing link. We now know. So on the right hand, you see all these hallmarks of cancer. Every one of those hallmarks is the subject of tens of thousands of investigators involving tens of millions of dollars investigating all these hallmarks of cancer. I'm not going to go through them all, but the one that's why cancer cells evade programmed cell death. If we stab ourselves, we get a lot of dead cells. The cells die naturally. Okay? They, draw, they don't have oxygen and they die quick. Cancer cells don't die. Why, why is that? Because the organelle that controls their life and the life of our cells is the mitochondria. It is the kill switch. When the mitochondria become abnormal, the cell dies through a very interesting biological series of events. But if the kill switch is broken, the cell continues to grow out of control. So all of these hallmarks. Now, the, 
the big dog here is metastasis on the bottom, number six. And that we have to work into the whole concept of energy metabolism. Because metastasis is ultimately the death, what, what kills most people. As a matter of fact, like I said last night, it's not clear whether it's the metastatic cancer that's killing the people or whether it's the toxic treatments that are being used to manage, try to manage the metastasis. We don't know that. Okay, so we can't be sure, but it's metastatic. Once your cancer starts spreading around, you get nodules all over the place, that's called metastatic cancer, and that's ultimately. So where does that come from? Okay, and here I'm showing this nice little diagram. You see the cells, the blue cells on the left are all standing in a row. They're all nice and neat. They're all columnar. They're very attached to each other in the basement membrane. Any one of those provocative effects from the environment can cause a destabilization in the growth of these cells, and they start to, they start to disturb, they start to grow. The red cells that you see there, that's our immune system. Our immune system surveils our body all the time. Those little cells now are growing a little bit uh, dysregulated, and they cause a disturbance in the microenvironment. It's like having a house fire in the neighborhood. Ooh, what's the smell? Smoke? Well, something's going on. Call the fire department. Fire department comes and hoses down with water, hoses down the house. Well, these red cells do the same thing, but it's out of context. They throw growth factors and cytokines to try to stop the environment, to, to, to try to stop this inflamed growing environment. And those factors are it's like, it's like the fire department throwing gasoline on your house. It, the fire gets even worse and burns down the neighborhood. And that's what's happening here. These cells aren't smart. They're, they're, they're genetically programmed over millions of years of evolution to perform specific functions. And if that function is done out of context, you, wonder, you get into a big problem. So, as you can see, these cells are very fusogenic. So what they do to try to put out the fire, they fuse with each other and with the other cells. Now, what happens over time, the, the red cells gain abnormal mitochondria from the cytoplasm of the cells that are dysregulated. Now, those cells, the red cells, already have the capability of moving in and out of our body. If I cut myself here, I got my, I've got local immune cells to try to fix, and I've got monocytes in my bloodstream from the spleen and, and thyroid gland, and they come flying into this spot to try to heal the wound. So they move in and out of our, our system all the time. So these red cells are now gaining the abnormal mitochondria from the cancer cells, the tumor cells. The tumor cells themselves can't spread. They don't have the capability of moving in. They're localized in that spot. But once those red cells now become contaminated with the abnormal mitochondria, they are already genetically programmed to spread through your body. Okay? And they suck down glutamine like there's no tomorrow. They're cells of our immune system. And I said last night, the immune system uses glutamine. Our normal red cells, and the, now this corrupted tumor cell, which is part of our immune system. The can metastatic cancer cell is us. It's our powerful immune system gone rogue. They live in hypoxic environments. That's why the angiogenic field doesn't work. Avastin and all those crazy things that people talk about. You can predict. When you understand the biology of the disease, you can predict all the stuff that's going to happen. And then they spread and they set up. And I don't want to get into the EMT and all this other stuff that our, my colleagues in the academic community talk about. But this is, this is the origin of medicine. So if most stands obtained energy through firm, what are we going to do to stop the tumor? We got to take away their fermentable fuels. One strategy is, is you target the fermentable fuels and you elevate non-fermentable fuels. And here's the you got calorie restriction and ke ke therapeutic ketosis that I talked about last night. So this re reduces glucose tremendously. Um, it maintains minerals and nutrients. TK, th therapeutic ketosis, reduces glucose. If you tumor cells, to, to burn ketones for energy, you got to have a good mitochondria. I just showed you evidence the mitochondria are, 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 are dysfunctional in cancer. Um, and also, uh, ketone bodies, for those people who don't have cancer, if you get into therapeutic ketosis, your mitochondria get super healthy, and the likelihood of getting cancer goes way down. All right? You can't get cancer unless your mitochondria are damaged. So how do you prevent cancer? Keep your mitochondria healthy. How do you do that? Do therapeutic fasting, calorie restriction, this kind of stuff. Not easy. And water-only therapeutic fasting, right? Oof. All right. Okay, that's enough. I don't want to talk about that anymore, right? Uh, then these ketogenic diets, such a misunderstood field. It's not, it's therapeutic ketosis. But how do you get into therapeutic ketosis? Well, one way, you can stop eating for three weeks, two, uh, seven days, and then stay on it. Oh, it's not, not good. Not, not, it works wonderfully, but it's not very hard. Ketogenic diets, a very massive misunderstanding in the field. It's not an Atkins diet. And you eat little, little bits of it. You don't gobble down a whole bunch of butter and lard and that kind of stuff. 
Um, anyway, very low carb, uh, very high fat. It must be done in restricted amounts. I worked in the epilepsy field for years. Any, every now and then, one, of, one out of two or 300 kids loves to take the oil, puts it on everything, and his seizures don't go away. Ketogenic diets are remarkably effective managing seizures in children, but you have to be rigid about it, and you have to keep the blood sugars very constant, very constant. And if you add too much fat, you get insulin insensitivity and the sugars go up. So it's, people have to know how to use this. It's a tool. It's a, it, this is medicine. We're not talking of, like we use drugs. A physician applies drugs to your body because he doesn't want to give you too much, it'll kill you. And not enough won't do anything. This metabolic therapy is the same. And every person is a different entity. So you really have to know what you're doing before you go out and do this stuff. And you've got to have knowledgeable professionals that will help you. Here's the simple, bring your blood sugars down and bring your ketones up. Ketones come from the metabolism of fats in our bodies. And then you can get into the state of managed growth. And I'm not telling you we can cure cancer by doing this. I say we shut down their ability to grow as fast as they would normally grow. It's a big difference than saying you can cure cancer with a ketone. You can't. I don't want to say you can't because can't, you, you, some people are doing very well, which I met from reasons I don't know but I would be shocked. So we, to help pa 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 patients we de at my lab, we developed the Glucose Ketone Index Calculator, published in Open Access Journal, Nutrition and Metabolism. Therapeutic efficacy is considered best with an index value of approaching 1.0 or below. You get a little meter from Amazon, Glucose Ketone Meter. There's a couple of them, Precision Extra, Mo Mojo, Keto Mojo, and these things. And you can, at home, you can take the meter, take the drop of blood, put it on the glucose stick, just like someone with diabetes. Oh, my blood sugar is there. Pull that stick out. Squeeze your finger again. Put the ketone stick in. Put that. I got the ketones. Now I have to just divide the ketones by 18 to get millimolar. And that's the calculator. And the next thing you know, you get your ratio. What's your ratio? People say, can I eat this? Can I eat that? I don't know. What's your ratio when you eat it? Oh, I didn't know about the ratio. You got to know the ratio because the ratio tells you whether you can eat that or drink this or whatever. Once, you're in, once you know you're in therapeutic ketosis, then everything, then you build your diets around your ratio. You understand what I'm saying? Okay, now, this was one of the first studies that was done in children with, with uh, hopeless, two little kids, hopeless cases, massive brain damage from radiation and chemo. They were both given up. And Linda Nebling at Case Western took these kids and the physicians at the time said, yeah, go ahead, try this. And she, uh, both kids uh, re res responded remarkably to reduced blood sugar, elevated ketones. One child lived far longer than was expected, and the other child was lost to follow-up. So when that means that they, they were water, and then she just moved somewhere else and nobody knows what happened. But this is the first and only time we've a adapted this to a children's pediatric oncology. It's never been done before. Yet we're doing the same thing in the epilepsy clinics all the time. Little kids with seizures, we use these metabolic therapies and manage their seizures. But God forbid we take a kid that has a brain tumor and do the same thing. Linda did it, opened our eyes, so we followed up and we did it in the mice. 